While we're waiting, here's some words. If you want, you can take a picture of these words, as long as you agree not to look at that picture until I tell you. If you want to, oh, hey, how you doing? It's okay, it's all under control, so I've just got people signing in there when they come in, so all fine, all good, cool. Um, so just try to commit these to memory, you know, using your mind. Um, the only reason you might want to take a picture is something's going to happen later in the lecture where you might think I'm lying to you uh, about the words that were there. So if you take a picture, you can confirm that I'm not lying to you, those are the words that were there. So check it out, do the best you can to commit it to memory, but yeah, once you take that picture, please do not look at that picture, um, especially at the critical point in the talk, what I'll, what I'll tell you about. Um, and it'll be pretty much the end of the talk, so. Cool. Got them all in your mind? Everybody got them memorized? Excellent. Let's jump in. So, what I'm hoping to do today, you're going to sense some overlap here with some of the little bits in the lecture. So, so I've been creating these little lectures in the textbook, um, and some of that stuff will connect with what I've done here, but I'm trying to connect it in a more broad way here. So I want to show you some really two central principles of the brain, to some extent, sort of three, I guess, um, that apply to all sorts of contexts, that apply to language, apply to perception, but also apply to memory. And it's memory that's perhaps the most surprising, and to really understand how our memory systems work, I think it helps to start with the perception and the, and the language and kind of realize what's going on. It's easier to understand there and then to go to the more complex case of memory. That's interesting. Anybody? Anybody's amygdala tingling right now? <laughs> Odd, unusual behavior. What are they saying? Okay. Somebody's excited. So we're going to talk about perception, we're going to talk about memory, and we're going to talk about some basic principles of the brain processing, the mind as it were. And these are the things we're going to just hit, um, just to give you a sense in advance. I want to show you that a really critical thing that... Excuse me, if you're going to, if you're going to come on in here, you're going to have to be quiet, and you're going to have to sign in up front. Okay? Cool. Thank you. Um, so, the first thing I want to really show you is that the mind's central role, almost, is to make sense of a very chaotic world that we live in, and I want to show you how it does that. What, what does the brain mean by making sense? And you're going to see already that sort of memory is playing a role there, or previous experience is playing a role. So even when it comes to our perception, our previous experiences, our memories, are affecting how we perceive the world. And what that will mean is that different people can perceive the same events and end up seeing it very differently. So we'll talk a little bit about that link between what's really out in the world and what you ultimately believe is out in the world, the reality you construct in your mind, and the importance of the sense-making process uh, to, to making that happen. I'm also going to highlight how the mind is inherently decisive. Um, it doesn't like to be in middle states. This talk was originally created um, for, for judges at this something called, wow, something called the National Judicial Institute. Okay. Um, he needs some assistance, that dude, I think. Closing the doors one way. I'm, I'm trying to think whether we should be calling somebody to, I don't know. Let's leave it for now. Let's see, let's see how it develops. This is not part of anything. <laughs> sometimes people suspect me when weird things happening. You have some teaching thing going on, don't you? Um, because I sometimes have weird things happening. This is not. So I'm concerned about him, actually. Uh, his sympathetic nervous system is in full flight. Right? This, this is what it sounds like when someone's sympathetic nervous system is. So he's feeling a high degree of anxiety and, and, and borderline panic right now, which is why I'm... Very strange. Okay, um, I'm really torn. Part of me wants to close the door, part of me doesn't want to close the door because I'm worried he needs... Um, let, um, do, 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 do. There's this emergency thing, but the emergency thing's a little too extreme. Um, We should know this, just a number to call for campus police. Does anybody know that? I kind of feel like this is in order now. Um, uh, 
Um, okay, I'm, I'm going to give him a bit to see if he's just if he's calmed down, um, but otherwise. I have that ready to go back to. OK, so um, I, I was just saying that I originally created these slides for talks I give to judges, Canadian judges, who meet regularly for education sessions. So they have to stay on top of their knowledge on things. And they're decision makers, right? Judges are supposed to be in this weird position of hearing evidence without making a decision until they've heard all the evidence. They're supposed to withhold what's called the judicial hunch the tendency they have to think they know how this case is going to unfold. And what, I'm, what I tell them and what I'll tell you is that task is almost impossible to withhold judgment on something because our brain, as it's processing information, quickly wants to categorize things. Um, and, and that informs the brain about how it can act. And so that means it's very quickly making decisions about things. Uh, and I want to talk to you about that a little bit. And that will finally bring us to the point of getting back to memory, uh, where we can talk about how this all works in a memory context. OK. So let's start with the making sense. And I've tried to create this to be as participatory as possible because you know, it's hard. You guys are doing this digital thing, asynchronous with the thing. And so this is a chance for us to be a little synchronous and, and, and be together. So lots of stuff we do here. So first of all, let me just be clear about this. I'm going to talk a lot about the brain trying to make sense of stuff. And I'm going to make this claim. And, and in the demos that we're about to do, I think this claim will start to make more sense to you. But I'll just say it right now straight up. Um, things make sense to the mind when they match up with previous mental experiences. And if they don't completely match, and by the way, they never do, um, then the brain is willing to find ways to enhance the match. Okay? So one of the core things to get from this is the reality you perceive in, in your mind is not what's out there. And if it was, it would be really chaotic. And so let me give you an example of that. So right now, you know, you see me, right? And I'm just here, and as I walk over this way, nothing really dramatic happens. But what? What do you mean nothing dramatic happens? I have no legs right now. My legs have disappeared in reality. You know, hitting your sense organs, my legs are gone. Um, this should freak you out to see a torso up here talking to you. It doesn't freak you out. You didn't even feel like anything happened when my legs suddenly disappeared. In your mind, they didn't disappear, even though in the world, into your eyes, they did. Uh, and suddenly they reappear. But, it's, but your brain kind of says, oh, no, the legs are still there. Everything's fine. And it sort of reconstructs a reality that's much more stable than what's really impinging on our senses. OK? So let's go through some of this. And I like to start with this quote. It's just a fun place to start um, to connect with this making sense. So this is from a Dan Brown book. Um, profs like Dan Brown books because the hero in Dan, Dan Brown books is a professor. Uh, so we all like when the professor's a hero. It doesn't happen very often. Um, it's also cool because you have a professional writer, Dan Brown, often writing about experiences just like this, where an instructor is in front of a class of students and of course, the writer can control the, the students as well as the instructor. And so you see these great classroom things play out. And I always find those really interesting to see a writer's perspective on how a classroom plays out. But when I was reading this book, um, it really struck me as related to this lecture we're talking about. So in this book, there's a character that's like Elon Musk. He's like a futurist guy, right? Always pushing the boundaries on what's possible. His name's Edmund. And he's about to address a bunch of people. And he says this, like an organic computer, your brain has an operating system, a set of rules that organizes and defines all of the chaotic input that flows in all day long. Language, a catchy tune, a siren, the taste of chocolate. So the point here is, at any given minute, you know, you can even, I, I like to do this to people, check in on your big toe on your right foot right now. You can do that, right? You can kind of pay attention to your right toe on your, your big toe on your right foot. Um, there's, there's stimulation coming there. There's stimulation coming out to your whole body. There's stimulation coming to your ears, to your eyes. Um, you know, just everywhere. The world is bombarding us with stimulation. And it's changing. Every time the sun goes behind a cloud, the color of everything changes. And so really, the stimulation coming at us is dramatic and chaotic and always changing. And your brain has to make sense of it.
So, as you can imagine, the flow of information is frenetically diverse and relentless, and your brain must make sense of it all. In fact, it is the very programming of your brain that defines your sense of reality. The reality you know is the result of a processed version of the reality that's out there. Um, and so it's not really a mapping of what's really there. So he says, if you could look at the human mind and read its operating system, it would look something like this. Despise chaos, create order. You're going to see this happening. Our brains are going to do this together in the next little while, and we're going to do it over a number of different um, contexts, and you're going to see this is one of the major functions of the brain. Although let me back up a little bit and say now that you guys are becoming neuroscientists, you're getting to know the brain and all that, what we're really talking about here are three lobes of the brain. Okay, the occipital lobe, the temporal lobes, and the parietal lobes. Um, those are the lobes that deal with the input from the world. Uh, and so they, that, that's the ones that are really trying to make sense of the input that's coming in. The frontal lobe, of course, has much more to do with our plans, our strategies, our goals. And so once we know the input, the frontal lobe is where some of the decisiveness is going to happen and where the actions are going to happen. Um, and so we're you know, really talking about the perceptual parts of the brain here. Okay, let's, let's do some of these. Um, this one I love to get a volunteer. Anybody willing to volunteer? All you're volunteering for is I'm gonna present something over there and in the lower part, there's gonna be sort of some weird looking text, but I'm gonna ask you to read it out loud. And I think you'll find you, it, you will be able to read it out loud, but I'd just like someone to, to do that, someone who's never seen the text before. Anybody wanna do that? Anybody, uh, your hand's halfway up, that's close enough for me. <laughs> so I am going to, let me get the right one. Um, I guess I should give you both, but then how do I reach? I am gonna give you both um, for a second. Um, one goes to the room, one goes to the camera at the back. So take both of these and just, you don't have to have them too close to you if you just have them like this. Hold on to that. I'm gonna have two of these here. One more battery. Oh. Excellent. Cool. Okay. okay. So I'm just gonna press the next slide. There's gonna be something on the top. I don't care about what's on the top. Something on the bottom. Just as quickly and fluently as you can read what's on the bottom. Okay, here we go. It doesn't matter in what order the letters in the word are. The sentence is still readable. Right, okay. Excellent. That's all I need. <laughs> A lot of microphone changing for, for a quick one. But yeah, you know, quite easily you can look at that and say, it doesn't matter in what order the letters in the word are, the sentence is still readable. You guys have seen this on social media and other things. Let me just let you look at it for a second while I turn myself back into a Christmas tree here. One second. Sorry for all the weird noises. Okay, good. So, yeah, simple demonstration, but, but look how powerful this is. How is this happening? What's the brain doing? It's never seen this before, right? This is a brand new novel stimulus. And it goes through and, okay, the it's easy enough. That's not a novel stimulus. But that next word isn't really right, right? But it looks kind of close to doesn't. It's just got a couple of the words flipped. So the brain's kind of like, okay, that's doesn't. And then once we got it doesn't matter, well, once we have it doesn't, it, matter is a very common next word. So as the words start coming in, the brain has experience with language. It knows about syntax. It knows about grammar. And so it starts to expect what's going to come next. This happens every time we read. Our brain is always sort of expecting that next word. But now we have these expectations combined with the ability of the brain to kind of say, oh, that's sort of like order, for example. Um, and it starts to just, what? Change reality. It starts to completely rearrange the input to create something that makes sense. And by makes sense, we mean fits with the kinds of things it's seen before. English sentences. So it turns it into a sensical English sentence. Um, and, and quite powerfully rearranging the stimulus in order to do that. Here's a different one. I'll have you look at this for just a moment. 
and then I'm going to ask you a question about it. OK, so you can use the Top Hat app here now. You should be able to see that there's a poll there and a, a very simple question here. So I just showed you a triangle. Um, I always have to remind myself of the right answer here. Uh, all right. So, uh, OK, good. All right, so I'll, I'll let you guys vote for a while. I just I usually let this come in for a little bit. Um, and then I'll just stop it arbitrarily at some point along the way after I have a good swig of coffee or something. And I'll also take this as a moment to look at the, at the questions while you guys are voting. <laughs> so I, I like the question. I'm confused about reality. So the person saying, my legs didn't really disappear. So in reality, they didn't disappear. But to the senses, they disappeared. Yeah, let's, <laughs> you get the idea. Let's not get too philosophical about that. Um, but, but I like that you're thinking so deeply. That's very cool. OK, so I'm going to now move ahead, look at the responses, see what we got. Oh, well, that's kind of weird, isn't it? It was pretty simple. Why do we have sixes and sevens? That's kind of confused, isn't it? Anybody pick seven? Those of you who picked seven, OK. Um, who picked six? OK, those of you who picked six, um, take another look. If I can go, it wasn't letting me go back yesterday, which was frustrating me. I had to, um, I don't know why it won't let me go back. Dang it. Because it means I have to leave. OK, I'm going to leave anyway. Um, means I have to leave it in order to go back to show you just this. But then I think that messes up the back channel. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start the back channel up and again. But look at that. Six? Is it really six? Often people will look at that after saying six, and they'll go, like, yeah, there's six. Yeah, there's six. And, and they might have to stare at it a long time. Anybody insist that there's six items up there? You know, at some point, you have to stop looking at the words and just say, OK, I'm going to count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. What, seven? What do we have? The, the. Right? The, the never happens. Um, and so to the brain, that's just ridiculous. It just removes one of the thes. Uh, and so we see, I, say, I love Paris in the springtime. That's what we've seen before. That's what makes sense to the brain. And so a lot of people saw six words there when there were in fact seven because the brain eliminated one. Okay, so those are two examples from language. The brain reorganizing input or in fact eliminating parts of the input to make sense of what it's seeing. OK, so I'm going to go back to the back channel, and I'm going to fire it up from there uh, again, um, just so it keeps running. And then I'll catch up to where I was. It's frustrating when it won't go backwards like that, though. OK. Excellent. So now let's go to perception. So that was language. I mean, it was language perception to to extent, but it was much more specifically where language was at play. Now let's just go to sort of raw perception. Anybody know who this is? Yep, go ahead. Judge Judy. Okay. Any so those people who didn't know Judge, I don't know how to say this right, but um, who here never heard of Judge Judy? few people, yeah. And did you see Judge Judy? Well, probably not, because how could you if you've never heard of Judge Judy, right? So I want to just make an important point here. So Judge Judy was a television judge. And as I mentioned, this was a presentation I gave to judges. So I like to use judge kind of examples. But she was a TV judge. My dad loved watching her show. And very frequently, there was this sort of iconic image of her at the judge's bench you know, giving a speech to some defendant or somebody about something. So you very often saw this sort of camera angle on TV. Now, if you are somebody who saw that, if you were experienced with that, if you've had previous experience seeing her that way, then when I show you this, your brain is able to pull her out of all of that mess. So I started with a Judge Judy thing, but then I did all this stuff on top of her to make it really hard to tell what it is. And yet your brain is able to, we, call it, we talk about it this way sometimes, pull the signal out of the noise. So the signal is the thing that's actually you know, not random. It's the Judge Judy. And then the noise is all that stuff I put on top of it. And your brain, as long as it knows Judge Judy, as long as it's seen this image of Judge Judy in the past, is able to extract that and see her here. Um, if you've never seen Judge Judy, you can't do that. 
And again, that critical point is memory, right? In, in order for us to perceive things, it depends on our previous experiences and how they, um, how they then factor into our recognition of things. Uh, so memory is affecting perception already. Here's another example, just get you to look at it for a moment. You guys have probably seen this before. It's, it sneaks into what we call the gestalt um, part um, of, of the chapters. And so if you look at that, and if I ask you, um, what do you see when you, when you look at that? And we can have this question again. It's, it's annoying me that we can't go backwards to do this, but um, I may not go backwards this time. But what, which of those captures best what you see? I think I will have to go backwards. Shoot. I'll let a few responses come in. I love that there's 266. I don't know if they're all connected, if the, all these people are connected or not, um, but that's a pretty cool number of potential responses. Um, I love it. All right, so we don't have to go too far for this one. It's, um, you guys have probably even heard this point before, but yeah, <laughs> okay. So in reality, those 11 people who picked the third option are right. You know, what's, what was really on that screen was sort of three Pac-Men in different orientations and three greater than signs, however you want to think of them, in three different orientations. Uh, but they were aligned in a certain way that allowed the brain to see it in a simpler way. Okay, and what do we mean by simple again? What do we mean by making sense? The brain likes things it's experienced. It experiences circles regularly. If we think of it in like the top of my coffee cup's a circle, we see how the lights are circles here. You know, our world has a lot of circles in it. Um, our world also has triangles in it, not as many probably as circles, but they're still pretty regular. Does our world have Pac-Man Pac and greater than and less than signs? Yes, but not very many. You know, not unless you're a vintage video game person, you're not seeing a whole lot of those. So when the brain, I'll try to go back again, uh, what if I closed close? Then can I go back? Let me go back. Ah, I don't like when it doesn't let me go back. Um, I'm going to go back. Hopefully this won't mess up the back chat too much. I was wondering if you could see, oh, maybe you can see in, in the slide itself so I don't have to go back. If you go on the, on the slides part of the app, you can see what I'm talking about there. So maybe I'll just refer to it there. Um, you know, what we see is two triangles and three circles. And when we see it that way, it's a simpler interpretation. And that's what the brain likes. So in order to do that, though, in order to see it that way, it had to create a triangle that doesn't exist. That top, what we would think of as the top triangle, the one that's sitting on top of everything else, um, there's no line or anything that defines that as a triangle. There's the Pac-Man mouths, um, but really, if you went towards any other position, you would see that there's nothing different on either side of the illusory lines. There's a sort of illusion of a, of a triangle there, but it is just an illusion. Our brain kind of creates that triangle to make it easier to understand what it's seeing. And easier, simpler, makes sense, means like things it's seen before, okay? So we're seeing this in language. We're seeing this in perception. The brain is always analyzing reality and then creating a sort of reality. So here's the sort of critical points from this part. Um, the brain will assume information, ignore information, reorder information, change information, do what it ever has to do in order to make input make sense to it. And making sense means fitting with things it's experienced before, okay? And so the brain is continually trying to understand what it's experiencing now based on what it's experienced in the past um, and using that as a way of understanding and making the world more stable than it really is uh, for us. And it happens quick like. So I wanted to mention this step. We live in a, at a time now where we worry a lot about things like implicit bias. And I wanted to just take a moment to talk about that um, and how that kind of fits into this. Because, you know, we often like to think that we have the actual information from the world, it comes in, and we make decisions or respond on that basis. But what I'm suggesting to you now is when this information is coming in, it's being filtered 
sort of through our past experiences. And those past experiences can include biases and they can include expectations about various things based on what we've seen in the media or various other um, sources or, or just in real life. So we're all seeing reality a little differently and this, this bias part can really have a, a strong effect that happens so quickly that we're not aware of it. So let me throw this out to you. One of the classic cases of these sorts of biases are with respect to prejudice. And we have a lot of researchers here at UTSC who are leaders in the world actually in studying prejudice, studying how these biases come in. One of the tasks that is used is, is one I'm gonna show you. It's the implicit association task. It's, it's one that's meant to measure unconscious biases. Because often most of us, like if I asked all of you guys, on a scale of one to 10, how prejudicial are you? Is anybody picking two or higher? You know, we all wanna say, mm, we're not prejudiced, we're, we're a number one. Um, you know, maybe we might say, okay, maybe I have a little bit of prejudice in me, maybe I'll go to a two or a three, but there's no way we're gonna see ourselves as quite prejudicial people. We know it's not socially appropriate, it's not how we view ourselves, but we may be prejudicial and not really know it. We may be doing like these microaggressions against certain people and not even be aware of it. How does that happen? Well, how do you study it? Let's kind of bring both of them in. And I, and I just think this is an interesting task that some of you guys might find interesting, so I thought I'd bring it in at this point. Um, it can work like this. So the experiment, as we would tell a subject, would say, okay, you're gonna sit in front of a computer. On every trial, you'll see a big face for a moment. It'll just flicker. It'll just come on and it'll go off and it'll be replaced by a word. And that word will either be the word good or the word bad. And what we want you to do is you have two little buttons that you're gonna press. If it's the word good, press that one. If it's the word bad, press that one. And do that as quick as you can. So we wanna see how quickly you can tell us you recognize it's the word good or the word bad. Okay, so now we do the following. Assume we have a Caucasian uh, participant here. Um, and assume we're investigating prejudice against African-American um, cultural group, okay? Uh, and so now what we could have is the following. We have this Caucasian person and the face in a given trial is either African-American or Caucasian. If this person is quite prejudicial, we'll probably see something like the following. If it's an African-American face and then the word bad comes up, they're real quick to respond relative to when it's a Caucasian face. So if they get Caucasian face bad, they respond, but if they get African-American face bad, they're faster to say bad. But if it's the word good, now it's the reverse. So they're fast now if it's a Caucasian face and then good, and now they're fast to say good. If it's an African-American face and then good, they're slow to say good, okay? And so the implication is that that face primes them towards good or bad. And if you're prejudicial, then that outgroup will probably prime you towards bad. And so you're kind of leaning towards wanting to say bad, which if the word is bad, you're real quick. But if the word is good, now you have to sort of backtrack and get back to the, to the good side, so to speak. So you can use tasks like this to measure how prejudicial somebody is. But again, the critical thing is that person may have no awareness of it. And, and may completely deny it. And it may not be any form of explicit prejudice, but it still may be a bias that person has deep in their system, you know, based even on movies they've watched or whatever that may have led them to have certain expectations about certain cultural groups. Um, so just to show how this all kind of feeds into the life we all, we all lead every day. Okay. So now I wanna to jump to part two of the talk. So we got part one, brain's always making sense, using past experience to do it. Part two is that the brain is very decisive. Um, and this is the part where the, the, the judges always hate because they're supposed to withhold judgment and I say your brain does not withhold judgment. So often decisions, our system evolved in a world where we had to be able to process the world very effectively and, and very quickly know what was out there and decide what to do. If we spent too long deciding it's time to run away from that predator, we probably got eight. Right? And those people who made the decisions really quickly were more likely to survive, more likely to, to dominate the gene pool. And so now we are the product of a bunch of critters that made decisions very, very quickly. And our brain still likes to do that. Um, 
sometimes there are more deliberate decisions. Which university are you going to go, going to, go to? That's not quick. But I'm talking much more perceptual kinds of decisions, um, as you'll see. OK. So let, let me show you. The point I want to make across three demos here is that the brain has a hard time seeing two different things at once. It sees one thing or the other. It'll jump perceptually from one position to another sometimes. So if I show you this woman, oh, I'm going to have to go backwards for this one too. Frustrating. If I show you this woman and I say, how old do you think that woman is? If you had to pick a category here for her age, what category would you pick from these? And so let's just go, we have the top hat poll where we can do this. And I'm going to have to come back to the woman. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to stop. OK, I think it's open now. Uh, let me make sure it's open. OK, good. So um, yeah, go ahead, answer away. Oh, maybe previous will go backwards. Ah, OK, I'll try that. All right, got a good number of answers coming in here. Fantastic. I'm going to jump on it now. OK, here we go. Wow, you guys are amazingly consistent. OK, I don't usually see this. Um, I usually see the, the bump where you guys have it in the 31, but there's also, also usually a very big bump in that last category. So the fun thing often when I present it is like, what? You know, half of you guys think she's at less than 30, and the rest of you think she's over 50. How can a person be both of those things? Um, you guys aren't seeing the older woman as much. So the fact of the matter is, let me see if I can close it, see if I can go backwards. That's not working either. All my attempts to go backwards are for naught. OK, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come out of it again. And this will probably mess up that other thing, but oh, whatever. OK, so let me just show you her again. This is what's called an ambiguous figure. There's two ways to see this, one of which you, most of you seem to already see. But let me just model it to give you a sense. So the younger woman. One woman is younger, one woman is older. The younger woman, to see her, if you don't already, kind of imagine her, if you look at me, I'm going to turn my head over my shoulder like I'm looking over my shoulder, and you will see a jawline for me with a little nose sticking out and an ear right here and an eye here. That's kind of what she's doing, right? When you look over, that's her jawline. This is her jawline looking over her shoulder. This is her nose. This is an eye. This is an ear. And she's just kind of back looking over her shoulder. And, and this thing down here would be like a necklace or a choker that she has on um, around her neck. So hopefully most of you can see that. Let me now try to show you the older woman, um, which most of you are not seeing. I, I should have, uh, if I get this prop on, it'll make, it'll make a ton of noise and stuff. So I'm not going to. Um, but it's like this. She's kind of tucked into a shawl. Sorry about the noise. She's got her chin tucked in. And that thing that was a necklace or a choker where you see the mouse right now, that's her mouth. OK, see that is her mouth. And then that other thing that I said was a chin of the young woman, this thing, that's a big nose. Big nose, bridge of the nose goes right up here. So great big nose, eyeball here, mouth here, and her chin is kind of tucked into a fur coat of a sort. Can anybody see that now, hopefully? So one of, the, one of the things with these figures, and the next one's even more powerful uh, in some ways, is you tend to see it one way or the other. And it can be difficult to see the other one sometimes once you've seen one. But once you've seen them both and you look at it, I can now see the young woman. I can see the old woman. I can see the young woman. I can see the old woman. I can't see them both at the same time. So it's like my mind wants to see it one way or see it the other way. So that's kind of dramatic with this one, but it's more dramatic um, with this. So this is one of our favorite little um, things in psychology. It's called the Necker cube. Um, it's just a cube. It renders not quite cube-like because of the projector. It's, it looks a little oblong, but, it's, but think of it as a cube. If you stare at this long enough, so you can try it just this way first. I'll try to guide you through it. But if you stare at it long enough, something really weird should happen. You should kind of see it one way, and then in 3D space, it just kind of changes and becomes a whole different cube. And then we'll change back. 
and it'll just sort of right in front of your eyes. And the important point again is you'll never see them both at one time. You'll see the cube go from one cube to the other. I'll try to help those of you for whom it isn't flipping with this. The idea of this figure is, he, here's the two different views you can see. The blue part of each, to try to see it the way it's implying, you try to imagine that blue plane is the closest plane of the cube to you in 3D space. So here we have that blue plane closest to us and what we have is a cube that kind of recedes upwards and to the right. Um, so hopefully you can kind of see that. And now when you go over here and you have this come to the front now, you want that cube to the front, that face to the front. Now the cube, I have, to, I have the other cube stuck in my head now, I have to flip it back. Um, okay, now the cube goes back down and to the left a little bit. So when you see that face is the front. Once you do that, you can come over here and you can kind of flip them both ways. See the, the blue fa face is the front, see the other blue face is the front, and you should be able to flip it back and forth. Let me cover this up now, again, see if it works for you. Um, and I'm just going to give you just a couple of minutes to look at that. And yeah, I blew the, so, so annoying, I lose the back channel when I, when I skip out of the thing. So we've kind of lost that back channel, which is a little frustrating. Um, I think it's okay for now though. Are you guys feeling that? People feeling the Necker cube flip back and forth? at all. This is used a lot in art now too because they like to have art on the wall where there's this stuff and somebody looks at your painting and goes, oh, that's really nice. And then they look at it again and it seems like it's changed. It seems like a different painting and they're like, whoa, what the heck is going on? So there's cool little illusions that go on with that. Again, you see it one way, you see it the other way, you can feel it flip back and forth. One of the things this really shows you is there is two realities. There's the reality of the stimulus that's out there and then there's what your brain makes of it. And in this case, the stimulus that's out there is not changing, but your brain's um, impression of it is flipping between two things, okay? One more example. Excellent. All right, so I am going to play an audio clip and just listen. So I will turn the projector back on. Oh, come on. Oh, now I've done it. <sighs> oh, okay, so you unmute. All right, all good. Uh, I, I'm gonna go all the way back just to get this back channel going. I'm just gonna go through a bunch of slides and sorry, just I want this back up for, because What I would like to do is have you guys now in that back channel, um, and, and we really only need, well, anyway, you, you can type what you heard, or if somebody's already typed what you heard, you can upvote what they typed uh, in that back channel. So that's the auditory example. So it should be running now. So go ahead, yep, we're seeing things flipping on through here. And, you know, isn't it kind of weird what we're seeing? There seems like two, peop two very different responses. There's things that are sort of Yanny-ish, and there's things that are sort of Laurel-ish. Um, Yanny and Laurel. How many people here in the classroom heard something like Yanny over and over and over again? Okay, how many people heard something like Laurel over and over again? Right in this very classroom. How many people who heard Yanny think it's ridiculous that somebody would have heard Laurel? <laughs> Nobody, <laughs> I find it ridiculous. I just hear Laurel, 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 Laurel. I can't imagine how anyone's hearing anything else. That's the only thing I hear. Um, what this shows is in certain situations, and this is one of them, once the brain forms an impression of an ambiguous stimulus, it sticks it, it holds onto it. It just says, that's what I'm hearing. Um, and I had to mute that. 
I had to mute the video because if you saw the title of the YouTube thing that says Yanny or Laurel, um, you would have all heard Yanny. Because if that's the first thing you saw, that's what your system would have heard. Um, whatever that you hear that very first time, it then gets kind of locked in with every repetition uh, of it that way. And so once again, the important point here is the brain is very quickly coming to a perception of what that thing is and then holding on to that. It doesn't like to be in a middle ground. It doesn't like to be a fence sitter. Uh, it likes to categorize things. Okay, how does it do this, by the way? A little bit of Piaget. You're going to get more of this in Psych A02 in the developmental psych part. Piaget was a, a French psychologist. He was one of the very first to start studying children and especially education in children. Um, but he also tackled the critical question, okay, when we're old, we can see things and know what they are. And we even know how to behave towards them. How did we get the ability to do that? How does this develop? And so he told the sort of a story like the one I'm going to tell you here uh, that involved these concepts of accommodation and assimilation. And so he said, let's imagine a child. And let's imagine this child lives in a world where all cats are nice cats. I know all cats are not nice cats. I know there are some mean human attacking cats out there. Let's pretend they're not out there. Okay, all cats are nice cats. And so this child, never seeing a cat before, comes maybe into a friend's home, and for the first time ever, it sees this cat. And maybe the mother of that friend says, he's a friendly cat, all cats are friendly cats in this universe, go say hi to him. Uh, and so maybe the child goes over and scratches his ears and pets him a little bit, and then the cat purrs and cuddles up, and the child has a very positive experience. Excellent. A Little while later, maybe in another home, the child sees this. It's not the exact same thing, right? It's similar, similar in body shape, has a bit of a different paint job, you know, looks different. Um, Color-wise, eyes are a little different, but it's sort of similar. What Piaget says is as we're learning concepts, what we will do first by default is something called assimilation. Assimilate the new thing into an existing category. And so we will basically say, I think that's a cat, like that other cat I met. And, oh, by the way, this gives me some information, because I went over and scratched that cat behind the ears and patted it and, it and had a really good time. It was really happy and we got purring. It was fun. That was great. So I should try that with this. So once I categorize, once I know what it is, I also know how to behave towards it, uh, which is very important. And so now I go over, I scratch the cat behind the ears, I scruff it, it purrs, everything's great. A little while later, I run into this guy. Again, a little different. Um, in a number of ways, but again, I assimilate it. I assume it's a cat. I behave towards it as if it's a cat. Everything happens good. A little while later, me and the family are walking in the woods, um, I, and I see this. Looks like a cat. Sort of, you know, very similar in lots of ways. Yeah, it has a different color scheme and stuff, but whatever. So the idea is, at this point, the child would probably assimilate that into the cat category. And it would say, I think that's a cat. And so what would it do then? Well, it would probably start walking towards the skunk to go scratch it behind the ears and scruff it. Um, if anybody doesn't know skunks, um, skunks are, are Canadian animals and, and American animals at least. I don't know how widespread they are in the world, but if you come too close to a skunk, its defense mechanism is to turn around, lift its tail, and squirt you with horrible smelling juice that stays on you for days and is almost impossible to get off. So it's really gross. So now imagine your child is walking towards the skunk. Either it's going to get sprayed um, and, or it's going to have a parent behind going, ah, oh, don't go near that skunk, don't go near it. And they'll go running and grabbing the kid. Either way, the kid is going to get a strong signal. This is different. Something about this is different than those because when I behave to this like I behave to those, bad things happened. You know? And so I have to now accommodate this new information. I'm going to have to create a new category that this now belongs to that differentiates it from that. And so the claim is, as we go through life experiencing things, we begin by kind of trying to uh, assimilate things into categories of knowledge we have. But when that doesn't seem like a good idea or a good fit, then we create new categories. And so as we go through life, we're continually creating categories, bringing things into it, and then eventually we use those to help us understand what's in the world. 
I always go to Google and I ask it to give me things, and I'm amazed how often it has what I want. I asked it to give me a skunk cat. That's the best it could give me. Um, this is a great example of how good our perceptual systems are. None of us are fooled by that. We all know exactly what that is, even though I put boxes all over it. Right? We, we are very good at recognizing that that's a cat. But um, imagine it was a little harder, um, that I had a better skunk cat. And so what I want to really talk to you about is there's two steps in this process. One step is getting the input from the world. Okay? And that's what I have with the red arrows. And very early on, that's the sort of more dominant part. We start taking information from the world. But as we start taking information from the world, our mind starts to connect parts of the world with category categories of knowledge. So it starts to say, oh, that part looks cat-like, and that part looks cat-like. Oh, this other part looks kind of skunk-like. Uh, and so it's starting to build an internal representation, and early on it is part cat and part skunk. But it doesn't like to be in those middle states. And so it uses the knowledge that it has to do something called build consensus. It basically starts de-emphasizing the input that's coming in, saying, let's not worry so much about the real world. We've got a sort of mix here. Let's try to figure out what this is. And so based on past experience, and you guys have seen this all happen now a couple times, it reorganizes the knowledge to make it either a cat or a skunk so that it can recognize what's out there. And then, you know, for us looking at that, we very quickly get to cat. Um, and that tells us again how we can behave. All right, so this is, this is the sort of two-step process where reality starts the show, but then the mind kind of takes over. We will talk about this in the chapters as sort of bottom up, which is sort of that sampling of the world versus top down. They talk about it that way. I talk about it more like previous experience. What they call top down, I think of more as previous experience. Um, but think of that sort of two-step process. Okay. All of that to kind of get us here. A little bit. But, you know, hopefully this will connect some of what you're learning about perception and the different processes. And one of the things I want to tell you is that we sometimes think of memory as sort of the end of something, right? We've had some experience, we did whatever, and then we commit it to memory. One of the things I hope you realize you start to realize is memory is in fact a much bigger concept. There's multiple kind of memories, and I've told you a few times our past experiences affects our perception, how we perceive things. That's memory, right? Our storage of past experiences. So memory is affecting perception. But when we talk about memory here, we're going to talk about a very specific kind of memory. Anybody here, um, well, let me just ask you, what did you have for supper last night? Just think of what you had for supper last night. This isn't what we think of as memory. Somebody asking us, you know, can you remember what you had for supper last night? Psychologists call that episodic memory because whatever's in your mind right now, it's probably got the answer that I just asked you, but it probably has got a lot more too. You probably remembered who you were with, where you had it, um, you know, other details that I never asked you about. You probably had a little episode of last night's supper replay in your mind. You kind of re-experienced that experience. Uh, in your mind. That's what we, you know, when we talk about memory, we often talk about that. That's just one kind of memory, just so you have a sense of different kinds. What's seven times six? Anybody? Wow, things have changed. Back in my day, we got drilled on these things. Everyone, you go, the time table is fast. But yes, if, if I ask you something like seven times six, you probably know it's 42, but you don't relive some past experience, right? What's the capital of Canada? Ottawa. Okay, you don't relive, you know, you're not back, oh, I remember my grade, two student, my grade two teacher teaching me that. That just becomes knowledge. It's stuff we know. We call it semantic memory. But when we pull that out of memory, we don't have an episode, right? So we're talking now more about episodic memory, what you really remember. And I want to focus on that and how that connects with what we were talking about. So, time for fun. This is my favorite demo. Um, how do we study memory? So just to give you a sense of some of the techniques, one of them is what we call old new recognition. I could use recall, by the way. I could just ask you, remember those words at the beginning of class? And don't look at your pictures if you, if you have them. Uh, remember those words at the beginning of class? What do you remember? Tell me what you remember. That would be called free recall, just asking you to just try to recall. That's one way to study memory. Another way is what we, what we call old new recognition 
where I say, here are some words. Some of them were on that list. We'll call those old. Some of, those, some of these are brand new. They weren't on that list, so we'll call them new. I want you to tell me which ones are old, i.e. were on the list, and which ones were new. Okay, so we could do with this with all of that, but let's, let's just focus on four. And for these four, I'm going to ask you the following question. So I'll ask it to you across slides in just a moment, but I just want to give you the sense. What I'm hoping here is to get at your memory, whether you think it was old or new, but also your confidence. How sure are you? Uh, and so I'm going to ask you to use this nine-point scale, as you'll see, or nine alternatives that will range from you're very confident it was not on the list to you're very confident it was. And so now we'll get a sense of whether people will think it's on or not, but we'll also get a sense of how confident they are. And we're going to go through these one at a time. And I just have to remind, well, I don't have to remind myself of something. I, I always forget one critical thing, but it's okay. So let's start with watch. Was watch on the list? Yes or no? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Uh, okay, I got these. Set. I will talk about this demo in my lecture, but there's nothing quite like experiencing it. So I'm glad we have this chance to do it before you run into it in the memory chapter. Uh, and you'll remember. OK, so that's fine. Uh, for the ones that follow, try to answer kind of quickly so that we're, we can move along if possible, but that's fine. Let's look at the responses. So I can tell you right now, watch was not on the list. OK, so what do we got? We got people kind of all over the board. We got a few people remembering it, that it was, even some pretty confident ones remembering there was. I mean, this just shows you sort of data kind of all over the board, right? So, so people aren't sure about watch. Um, we've got some people confident it wasn't, people confident it was, just kind of all over the board. That's fine. OK, let's do another one. Bed. Was bed on the list? <coughs> There's two items I'm going to call critical items. This is one of the critical items. Um, bed was not on the list. Surprising. So you're showing what I usually see, not as big as I usually see it. Um, but you see, the most common answer was, yes, it was, and damn right it was. So it was a very confident yes, right? So a lot of people, 12 people in this class, uh, 12 people that voted, I didn't see the total, 12 out of 43, it's usually more around 40% that end up in that category. Um, but just you know, think for a moment what, what I've just told you. This was not on the list, and about 40% of people not only say it was on the list, but they say it with a very high degree of confidence. They know it was on the list, but it wasn't. They're wrong. Just think about that for a little bit. Okay, let's do another one. Candle. Was candle on the list? Yeah, and anytime we get up around 40-ish, that's going to be a license for me to fire away. Uh, candle was on the list, okay? And, and we're seeing generally people, you know, a few sort of yeah, no's, but generally people are on the yes side. It was on the list. Uh, but, but, you know, yeah, okay, whatever. It was on the list. Let's just do it that way. Let's go on to the next one. One more. Needle. Was needle on the list? Cool, thanks for answering quick. That's good. A few more responses. OK. Needle was not on the list. Needle and bed, neither of them were on the list. This is a sort of replication. So again, this is the condition where we find a word that wasn't on the list. The most common response is, yes, it was, and I'm absolutely sure of it. Again, typically, even with judges, and this really messes judges' heads, I have to tell you, when you tell them, hey, you guys are experiencing what we call a false memory. Um, you remember something occurring that never occurred, and you're really confident you're right. 
some of the people who are testifying in your courtroom are exactly like this, right? And, and you now know that you're, they're not necessarily lying. It is possible to really believe something happened with high confidence when it never did. Now, should you trust me at all with me saying that? So this is where I said you can take a picture. You can look at your picture now if you want from the beginning of the class. Uh, but this is the same set, so I'm just showing you. These are the items I showed you. Go ahead and make sure that bed and needle are not on that list. Like I said, they weren't. But when you do that, notice something else. There is, well, OK. To make this list, there was a step first. And the first step involved asking people for what are called primary associates. So we would say to people, what's the first word you think of when I say the word bed? And they would say things like sleep, uh, pillow, dream, mattress, sheet, night, tired, blanket. Um, so these are all associates of the word bed. And similarly, we'd say, what's the first word you think of when I say the word needle? And they would say, um, tetanus, stitches, yarn, thimble, cactus, shot, thread, pierce, maybe. So those are all associates of the word needle. So if you kind of think of associate, it's kind of like this word bed is in the middle and here's everything that's associated with it. We didn't show you bed, but we showed you everything that just fit with bed. And so when your mind is now, so, so now your mind isn't sampling the world and making sense of it, it's sampling the traces of past experiences stored in your memory. And, and that's appropriate way of saying it. Your memory does not store things like your phone does. It does not store completely captured experiences. It stores bits and pieces of that experience. And then when you try to recall it, what were the words that were shown? You get those bits and pieces, but the brain also tries to make sense of that, makes it sort of fit together. How does that fit together well? Well, the words bed and needle kind of hold these words together. They're kind of the glue that connects so much of this. And so the words bed and needle feel like they fit there a lot. And when we show you bed, you're like, yep, that, that feels right, all right. And so the point here, again, is your brain is making sense of stuff. It's changing things. It's, it's taking what it has, whether that comes from reality or whether that comes from memory, and then it's making assumptions and filling in gaps to create the reality you experience. And that reality, we can't tell the difference between the stuff that was really retrieved and the stuff that our brain filled in to make sense. Once the brain does its thing, we get what we get. And it all looks just as valid to us. It all seems just as valid. Uh, and so that's why we can have mistakes in perception, but also why memory itself can be very hard to, tr to, to trust. I, I studied memory for years, and the biggest, well, I still sort of do, but the biggest thing that's left me with is I don't trust a thing I remember. Um, especially with my, if my wife and I disagree, I'm like, you're probably right. I don't know. I, have no, I, I, I won't commit to anything that I think I remember because I'm so sure that my brain might be just telling me I remember it that way. And that's not the way it was at all. Uh, so I, I kind of saw something like that. Is it a Ted Lasso or something? I, I can't remember. I watched something the other day, and somebody is telling a story, and they're very heroic in the story. And the person says to them, I don't think you were really her that heroic. And he said, well, that's my memory of the story. And so he was just clinging to it, like, I don't care if I was or not. That's how I remember it, and I like it. Um, and that's sort of what our brains do all the time. We remember things the way we do, and that's, that's how we um, think of it. OK, so really, a lot of talking today to try to drive home a couple points to you. And, and those points are that the biggest thing that your brain spends a lot of time doing is trying to make sense of the input. And as it does so, errors creep in because it actually changes the data or adds to the data or moves the data around to make it fit with what you've experienced before. Uh, and so it's really good to be aware of that. Um, yeah, and just know that this is happening. And don't always trust your, your reality. And also, also, you know, this explains things like why it's important for us to accept other people's perspectives about issues. That when we think about some issue, we're coming at it with our past experience. And we're seeing that issue through the filter of our previous experiences. Somebody else with very different previous experiences can look at the same thing and see it very differently. 
Um, and often, what we see by talking to those people and comparing our realities is a much richer and an accurate representation of that. So if it were a problem and you could see it through the eyes of many different people, you would understand that problem better. And then if you want to do a solution, you have a much better sense of that, of that problem. So realize how idiosyncratic your reality is. And one of the things you should do is, yeah, combine and accept other people's realities that might be different. And notice that it should be. It shouldn't be surprising if somebody says, that's not the way I see it. You should be, oh, interesting. Can you tell me how you see it? I'd be, I'd be curious to, see how, to hear how you see it. And don't fight them. Just ask, just mine their mind. Well, how do you see it? I'd like to learn from how you see it. And I'm curious why you see it one way and I see it differently. Let's think about this. And you'll probably walk away with a much richer understanding of that thing. Um, okay, anyway, that's, that's the sort of big point uh, for this lecture. Just giving you a sense of, of those core things the brain are doing. Um, I hope the live lecture thing was kind of fun other than the other than the individual who hopefully is getting some assistance right now. That was a little dramatic. But I really want to thank you guys all for coming and doing the false memory thing because I love having lots of people for that. So fantastic.